So here we are in the final part of our New Zealand opening batting odyssey. And I want to talk about BJ Watling, which might seem weird as you're probably thinking of BJ Watling as the stodgy middle order glue that made New Zealand into the team it was as it won the World Test Championship and went to number one in the world. And that's because over the last few years, you're right, he was that person, locking up an end like the straight man boyfriend in the background of a sitcom. But before Watling was this middle order rock, he was a useless New Zealand opener. But let's go back to the beginning of his career. He actually started the first couple of first class games as a number seven wicketkeeper. Then he was promoted to opening and stopped keeping altogether. As an opener, he averaged around 30 for five years. And yet still, they promoted him, because of course they did. And over four tests as a non-keeping opener, BJ Watling stunk out the joint and was dropped for a year. And when he came back, other than filling in as an opener once, he batted in the middle order and was a wicketkeeper. There, he averaged 40, with a strike rate of pretty much the same, which is not particularly normal for number six or number seven, but he made so many runs that New Zealand didn't care. He's the kind of middle order anchor you might need if your country doesn't really produce openers. But I get this feeling that BJ Watling is kind of one of the lucky ones. New Zealand non-openers average 4.4 runs more than their openers since 1980. They lead the major nations in this. And I wonder what happens when you look at opening batters versus number sevens. Their openers are a quarter of the run better than their middle order guy. And look at everyone else. It's not even close. Number seven is your keeper or a bowling arounder. And an opener is a specialist. And in New Zealand, they're interchangeable. So much so that Watling literally went from one spot to the other. So how many guys out there are like Watling that would have had very good careers if they were just allowed to bat in the place that New Zealand batters are better at the batting? I can't really work this one out because so many of those guys like Watling probably opened up in first class cricket too. Because even if you're bad at the top, eventually someone has to bat there. I think it's a hard thing to prove. But with Watling, we got the ability to show it just because of his keeping. But there was another New Zealand opener who sprung to mind. Few players in the history of Test cricket have ever had a successful career after having a worse start than Ken Rutherford. In his first 20 innings, he made it to double figures on five occasions. It took him eight innings to score 10 runs. And while not all of those were opening, in half of those two innings he did open, and his top score was 12. I think if New Zealand proved anything, it's that Ken Rutherford could not open. So starting his career there almost ruined what was a very good first class player. He had averaged 45 for Otago, but his career was almost ruined at the beginning just by sending him up the top. And because he started so slow, from that point forward, Rutherford had to grind out every test run he could. But I wonder how many other players out there just never got the chance to do what Watling or Rutherford actually did. This video is an ode to the openers who made it and the many who did not. Now, if there was a type for New Zealand openers, then I'd say Watling would fit that very well. I mean, he was still basically opening the batting in style when he was batting in the middle order. Over the last five years of his career, he had the second slowest strike rate in test. And that's cool because New Zealand is also the second slowest. We only have good ball by ball data from about 1980, which is where I've started this. But my guess is that New Zealand would be even slower when we look at runs per over. But second slowest, when only Zimbabwe is behind you, is massive. So we know that New Zealand openers are slow. But we also know that six years into his career, Brendan McCullum, Prince Brendan, BMAC, Baz, gave up the gloves and started opening the batting. He did it like it was a normal thing to do. Not that McCullum ever did anything remotely typical. This anti-boycott golden IPL slogger invented a method of batting that had him as New Zealand's number eight when he started. But it did work. In his wicketkeeper phase, he averaged a healthy 35, but as an opener, that went up to 39. Now, it is important to note that he was an incredible opener in Asia and fairly ordinary everywhere else, but eventually he would go into the middle order as a batter and average 44. This means he was a wicketkeeper turned Asian specialist opener who ended up being better as a non-keeping, non-opening, middle order specialist batter. This is perhaps even weirder than his technique. McCullum slowed down a fair bit from his normal strike rate when he opened, but he was still the quickest ever. Although being the quickest Kiwi opener ever is a bit like being the best singer at a mute colony. Only four openers with 10 or more tests have a strike rate over 50. This is a country who had spent a lifetime reaching for the most boring grind as they could to fill this role. And then one day they just said, fuck it, let's go with the glow in the dark unicorn. 
This might be the weirdest choice for a long-term opener in the history of cricket. But because it was New Zealand, no one noticed. And if you want proof that no one notices what Kiwi openers do, look at the career of Martin Guthrie. People barely mention how incredibly poor he was in Test Match Cricket. 300s in 47 tests. And all of that gets worse as an opener. In his first seven tests, he averaged 24. Then he was moved down the order. And his second test away from the Kiwi death slot, he made 189, his highest test score. But he had to open, because he is an opener. And he made runs opening in the Plunkett Shield and in county cricket. He is an opener in every single place. And then he gets to test cricket, and he's averaging 27. I don't want to say the position is jinxed, but the position is jinxed. It's not bad enough in Test Cricket that you're opening up against Dale Steyn or Dennis Lilly. New Zealand seems to also be facing demons from another realm, and it can turn a free-flowing white ball stud like Guptill into a walking wicket. So what would it do to a normal batter? Let's pick one at random. Um, Trevor Franklin. While never destined to be a star, Franklin could blunt the new ball. He was the prototype, and in fact an early domestic teammate, of Mark Richardson. But let's focus on that curse. In a 1986 tour of England, Franklin's thumb was broken. That's a pretty common injury for an opener. Then later on in the tour, he was run over by the baggage trolley at Gatwick Airport. That's less likely. He didn't play for 18 months afterwards. Another time he got his arm smashed off. It seemed like some dark force did not want Franklin to bat. That force may have been the spectators, because there's something you need to know about Franklin. He was the slowest New Zealand opener we have on record, but that's selling him short. He was actually the slowest opener we have data for, and also the slowest specialist batter of the modern era. And if Charles Davis stats are to be trusted, and I think they are, then Franklin is the seventh slowest batter in the entire history of the game, ever. This position is haunted. And all of this brings us to Bert Sutcliffe. In the 1949 Tour of England, only his second, he scored 32, 82, 57, 9, 101, 88 and 54. And that may not sound like a mountain of runs, but Bert Sutcliffe batted a lot of time and New Zealand didn't lose a test against England, four draws. And a lot of that was inspired by Sutcliffe's batting and it had a bigger impact as well, as England actually changed how long New Zealand's test matches were in England after that. That's some huge impact. And after 10 tests, Sutcliffe was averaging over 50. He was already the leading run scorer in New Zealand history. It was clear that New Zealand had some player. And then he played his 13th test, which is probably the most infamous moment in early New Zealand cricket history. It was a match that ended with Bert Sutcliffe's head dripping blood. So on stumps of day one of this game in Johannesburg, South Africa were 259 for eight. The next day was Christmas, so they had a rest. Back in New Zealand and completely unrelated to the cricket, a train driver was not aware of a mudslide ahead of him. And at the last moment, the emergency brake was used. A local foreman also tried sandbags to slow it down, but the train went into the river. They call it the Tangawa disaster, and it's still the worst rail accident in the history of New Zealand. 151 people died. Among them was a woman named Narissa Love, who just happened to be the fiance of Bob Blair, who was playing for New Zealand in that test. Blair was only 21 years old, and when he heard the news of his fiancée, he never left the hotel to head down to the ground for Boxing Day. South Africa were bowled out quickly in the morning, which meant that New Zealand had to face up to Neil Adcock, who at the time, if he wasn't the fastest bowler in the world, was certainly up there. Also, the reports from the pitch was that the ball was going vertical. The openers were Jeff Rabone and Murray Chappell. Both of them were hit before they were dismissed. In that game, Sutcliffe didn't open for only the third time in his career at that point. Sutcliffe was hit in the head the third ball. He lost consciousness on the ground and bled on the wicket. He was taken to hospital and he lost consciousness again when he was there. But he still headed back to the ground and then decided he was going to bat, even though the follow-on was still a long way off. While he was out in the middle, they actually gave up using bandages on him and instead used a towel. With a little whiskey in him, blood loss and concussion, he decided to attack Adcock and Hugh Tayfield. He was the only New Zealander to pass 35 and he did get them beyond the follow-on. And when the ninth wicket fell, Sutcliffe was still at the crease, and he turned and started to leave, believing that Blair was still at the hotel. But on his way off, he noticed that Blair was coming out, even though New Zealand was still over 100 runs behind. Blair, like Sutcliffe, had put the team before himself. Sutcliffe had already been attacking, but with Blair out there, the both of them actually swung. They scored a then record 25 runs off a Hugh Tayfield over, which being that he was one of the most economical bowlers in history was a fair effort. 
And here they were, the drunk, bleeding concussion victim and the heartbroken kid. Neither of them should have been out there. It was too dangerous. They couldn't have been thinking straight. But on the worst day of Blair's life, and the most impactful one of Sutcliffe's, they put on 33 runs for the last wicket. It didn't win them that test. They still lost easily. In fact, they wouldn't win a test series for almost 20 years after that. But New Zealand cricket was different after. But sadly, so was Bert Sutcliffe. From then on in, teams would bowl short to him, and he would flinch. He'd average 36 from then on in, but the magic he showed early on didn't stay there. And by the end of his career, he was just a middle order player and no longer an opener. But even with that, he would end up with an average of 45 as an opener. Maybe less than what he should have, but still New Zealand's third best ever. Sutcliffe is still a hero to New Zealand cricket, but perhaps not in the way that he should have been. Sutcliffe admitted that he never recovered from that blow, and this incredible cricketer would finish his career without ever being in a winning 11. Not a single win. And yet, even after all that flinching, he just kept batting for his country. And that's it, isn't it? This is New Zealand's opening history. A flash of talent, a crazy story, something that haunts them, and grinding as hard as they can. No matter what is thrown at them, one way or another, New Zealand openers just keep batting, and battling, and batting, and battling.